Okay, so we're looking at this question uh, kind of related to a Ferris wheel. We're saying a passenger compartment of a rotating amusement park ride. I don't know if Ferris wheel is like, if it's like trademarked or something. I don't know why they call it a rotating amusement park ride. I mean, Ferris, is that, is that like a name? I don't know, whatever. Um, contains a bench on which a book of mass MB is placed as indicated by the dot in the left figure. I lost where I was reading. Left figure below because I messed up the order. The compartment moves with a constant angular speed about the center of the ride along a circular path of radius r. The bench remains horizontal throughout the compartment's motion. The figure, the right figure above or below shows a magnified view of the compartment. So we're looking, hey, here's the compartment. That's kind of where we were sitting when we were on that exciting ride. And yeah. So they're also calling to kind of to point out this is x equals 0. So 0 is over here. To the left is negative and to the right is positive sticking with those conventions so we're saying over here the graph below shows the horizontal x component of the book's position as a function of time where the positive x direction is to the right so we're looking hey what is the period of a revolution of the book so a period we said is just going to be one full rotation one full cycle so in this case it's a little bit hard to think about just the x direction so let's kind of come up here and say, okay, well, we want to know for one full rotation. So we start out at x equals zero. That's kind of our beginning point. Now let's think about what else is happening in the x direction. So it goes over there, if we're just looking at the x direction. Sure, it's kind of um, spinning, but if we think about uh, boiling this down to strictly the x direction, first we go in the negative direction. We reach kind of this maximum. So we reach this maximum of this negative x, and then as soon as we hit this maximum, we're going back towards zero. We go from this negative x to zero meters. All right, and then when we hit the zero, we keep on going until we get to some positive x. But we're still not at some complete cycle yet. We have to get back to x equals zero. So we're at this positive, and then we go back in this direction. So we go from zero to negative, to zero, to positive, back to zero. So that's a, yeah, let's just look for one full cycle. We'll have that full motion, that one full there and back again. So in this case, we go from zero to negative, negative to zero, like we said, zero to positive, and then positive back to zero. So it looks like that time is, what are the iterations on here? 120, 140, 160, 180, 200. So it looks like it takes us 120 seconds, oops, 120 seconds for one full period. All right, 120 seconds. And we can also say, well, if we're looking at the sinusoidal type graph, one full cycle is just going to be one sine wave. So this is really just one sine wave, and then it keeps on repeating. But that is one unrepeated sine wave. So we can also just say, hey, this is one sine wave. All right, then the next part, calculate the tangential speed, VB, not the angular speed of the book. All right, so we're thinking about that. We want to know what is the speed around it. So like, hey, this thing is spinning. It always has this tangential velocity. If we think about a circular path, I'll come and draw it over here. We said in order to have this circular motion, at every single point, we need the velocity to be perpendicular to the path, and then this force to be perpendicular to the velocity, or pointing directly inwards. So at each of these spots, we have this tangential velocity, a velocity that is tangential to the path, tangential to the circular path, meaning that there's one point of that line that contacts the circle. So our velocity, we want to just know, hey, what's its speed? How fast is it going? So we know that velocity, or speed, is just equal to distance over time. So we have distance divided by time is equal to our velocity. So distance divided by time, let's see, are we able to figure out the distance that we travel? Well, we do know that the furthest point that we go away from x is looking like 30 meters. So it looks like this furthest x position that the book is traveling is 30 meters. And 30 meters over here too, that's kind of our maximum. So it looks like the wheel's radius is 30 meters. I guess they're calling that capital R. So our radius is 30 meters. 
But if we're thinking about this, 30 meters isn't the distance we travel. We're going around this circle in full. We're kind of going around the circumference of the circle. So we know if we want to find the circumference of a circle, we can do the circumference is equal to 2 pi r. So in this case, the distance that we're traveling is just the circumference. So our distance is equal to 2 times pi times 30, or 60 pi. So that's our distance. And then how much time does it take to do that? Well, the time for one full cycle is just going to be the period. That's what our period is defined as, the amount of time for one complete cycle. So we said the amount of time for it takes for us to go one complete cycle, one complete rotation, is just going to be 120 seconds. So we said period is 120 seconds. So our velocity is distance over that time. So this is equal to pi over 2 for our velocity. So our speed is going to be pi over 2. All right, what are the forces and direction of these forces that act on the book at the lowest point of its circular path? So let's see, we did this a little bit before, but let's kind of, let's replicate this really quick. We have the book. All right, we don't need to replicate it. We can do it right here. Um, so let's do our process. Let's circle the book and then think, okay, is there anything that's crossing this circle? Anything that's directly coming into contact with our book? It looks like we have a contact force from this surface. So it looks like that's really the only thing that's contacting our book. So let's think about it. Um, we know that we're going to have, we kind of draw out our force diagram, a normal force. And we said normal forces always act perpendicular from the surface. So in this case, the surface was down here. The book was right here. So we have this perpendicular force, this perpendicular normal force. And then we know that this object exists on Earth. It has mass. So we have a gravitational force acting on it. And then the final piece that we can say when we're looking at this, the normal force is not going to be equal to the gravitational force. In this situation, we have circular motion. And we know that in order to maintain a circular motion, we need a net centripetal force. Our total force has to be pointing inwards towards the middle of our circle. When we're at the bottom, the middle of our circle is up. From that perspective of the book, it's pointing upwards. So that means that our normal force has to be greater than the gravitational force. And actually, I think that's a question that shows up later. Yeah. Yeah, this is this question right here. <laughs> is there a, is the net vertical force on the book? In this case, like we just explained, in order to have, so without, yeah, okay. I should have remembered that this <laughs> was a question. But yeah, so it's saying, hey, without doing any equations, explain why this is happening. The book is in a circular motion. In order to maintain a circular motion, we need a net inwards pointing force. When the book is at the bottom, oops, bottom, bottom of the um, circular path, the middle of the circle is directly above it. We need a net force pointing up in order to maintain a circular motion. Um, yeah, so just kind of this idea that in order to keep a circular motion, you need a net inwards force. You need something pulling it back in. If we just had this balance force where we had, oh, the normal force and the gravitational force, if those equaled each other, this thing, based on Newton's first law, it would just continue moving in a uh, straight path, a straight path with a constant velocity. But if we have an acceleration, we have a net force, this object, it is accelerating. It's changing the direction of its velocity. I guess it's going the other way, but the direction of its velocity is constantly changing. So that means it's technically accelerating, and it's not moving at this straight path with a constant velocity. Drive an algebraic expression for the vertical force that the bench exerts on the lowest on the book at the lowest point of the circular path in terms of the book book's mass, tangential speed, radius r of the path, and physical constants as appropriate. And don't substitute any numbers in because we got numbers earlier. So what we can say is we can use our equation and our answer from up above and say, well, our net force is made up of a positive normal force pointing inwards towards the middle of our circle and a negative gravitational force. And we know that the net force equals mass times acceleration. When we're dealing with a circular motion, though, 
the acceleration, we can replace it with v squared over r, our equation for centripetal acceleration. We said before that the tangential acceleration, the acceleration we're used to, um, we can find it by saying, oh, the change in velocity over the change in time. In this case, the velocity is changing, but the magnitude of the velocity is not changing. And because the magnitude's not changing, this delta v would just be equal to zero because the magnitude, the actual number, is not changing. We're changing the direction. That's what's causing our acceleration. So we need this special equation for centripetal acceleration. Um, and then let's kind of sub in what we know. They're telling us we want to find normal force. We know that the gravitational equation, gravitational force equation, is just mass times g. In this case, we say, hey, the mass of the book is just mv equals mv. Uh, they said v is vb, yeah, over r. And if we want to solve, we can add mbg to both sides, mb vb squared over r plus mbg is equal to our normal force. And that's our equation. That's kind of all we got to do. All right, at the lowest point of the circular path is the force that the bench exerts on the book greater than, less than, or equal to the weight of the book. We said that at the lowest point, the normal force has to be greater than the weight. And why is that happening? Again, same idea. We need a net inwards force to maintain circular motion. So we need a net inwards force to maintain circular motion. Um, and if we're kind of looking at this C over here, if um, mvg is greater than, wait, where do I want to go with this? I don't know where I want to go with that. Oh, I guess over here. Um, first, we started with this fn minus fg equal to mv squared over r. If fg was greater than fn, then this mv squared over r would be a negative quantity, which means that it would be accelerating in what we're calling the negative direction, which would be outwards away from the, that is not a good circle, outwards away from the middle of our circle. That's negative, and we said that inwards is positive. So if fg was greater, we would have a net negative force, a net force that is outwards away from the middle of our circle, which would not be conducive to us traveling in this circular path. Yeah, that's kind of that Ferris wheel question. All right.